people. I hope uh, that uh, that this webinar will be a continuous of uh, continuous medical educations. And you see that from the start of the beginning of the COVID area, there is a very high level of uh, continuous medical educations done by Roya in cooperation with the industrial company, which is their, their role is uh, to continue in these years without this uh, condition, there is no face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, start education, so don't lost one year without any, educa any uh, educations. Uh, there is improvement, uh, I'm not, not improvement, but this is upgrading of these educations. Uh, this upgrading is starting by lectures, starting by tests of each guest to have, starting by eminent uh, professor from everywhere, either from Egypt or from international uh, country, either from Asia, Europe, uh, United States. Uh, this, so, so this is like uh, a combination of uh, continuous congress all over the years. And then every day we have something new. Every month we have something new. Between first we have uh, live cases which is recorded, uh, and then the discussions with the, the doctor will do that. And some cases we do uh, actually live uh, from Cairo uh, to the all the audience. Uh, sometimes we have lectures with discussions. Now this is an, another step in education. So I think by the end of the year, you will get all the information about JIT uh, and the and also the disease, what is recent, what's new. So you will not lost uh, uh, this years without any added, any another uh, information. So in this time, in these two hours, uh, uh, we will get different things. So we're working from up to down or working up and down. So we have a GERD, which is a very important subject. Uh, uh, and also we have uh, down, which is a polypectomy, how to remove a polyp. So it's a new that you have a hand on to let you know how if you have a polyp to remove to remove this polyp. So I think this is a, a, a new thing. I think never done before, maybe in the Middle East or Europe. Uh, these combinations of hand on and lectures and working in two uh, uh, spaces, one on the girl, one on the upper GIT and one on the lower GIT or polypectomy either when it's upper or lower. The second thing is uh, the company. We uh, like to thank uh, all the company and especially we like to thank AstraZeneca for uh, uh, taking care of uh, this educational program. You know, AstraZeneca, one of the company which is taking care of too much of education in the last 25 years. And they're looking for educations not for a purpose of sailing or increased sales, but purpose of increased knowledge of, uh, of the doctors. So for, for, for these reasons, today you have uh, uh, four eminent uh, people who will be with us. Uh, uh, we have two lectures about GERD, starting with Dr. Amro from India, which is a very nice town, and we invite everyone to go to this country. It's cool in India, and he said to me that this count, uh, country, it's between Pompeii and Adrabat, and they had a very nice weather, uh, and he is director of the uh, Center of Digestive Disorders, and he is very famous uh, uh, by his lectures about uh, uh, management of GERD. So, and also we have with us, Dr. Hazrat Ali, which is a professor in Alexandria, and also Dr. Hazrat is known to all the people in, uh, in Egypt and other Arabic countries. Uh, Dr. Hazrat is a professor of gastroenterology and hepatology. Uh, he's working also in uh, Boskibi, working also in liver disease. He will give us also a lectures on 
uh, uh, on gold. Then after that, you will go to another era, which is a new era, and we hope this is the first time to give that. It is uh, how to do, uh, how to uh, to learn you by hand on. Uh, it was done by also two eminent uh, starring uh, doctors. They are not star I think they are leaders now uh, because uh, they have very high impact on um, in educations in Egypt. Dr. Al-Adi, uh, Hamad Al-Adi, uh, and Dr. Uh, Mustafa uh, Ibrahim, which will give you an idea about how to perform a prophectomy and the health discussions. How the day is going, it's you have lecture, lectures, and then you have some break. Uh, you take coffee, but you take coffee in your home. We, don't, we cannot present coffee here, because coffee can be go through internet. If you can, we can do that. But I will ask Nuran, which is working uh, with us, is it possible to promise coffee to them? And then after that, we'll go to the hand-on. So I hope that in the next two hours, will get a high, a huge amount of knowledge about uh, this very sophisticated, uh, uh, what's called decision on uh, uh, combinations of lectures and on with different subjects. You will start first by uh, uh, the, the question at the end. So any question you'd like to give it, you can send it at the end. All the people will stay with us. So if you have a lecture, give it at the end, and we will, we will uh, ask about that. Uh, also, during the hand-on, if anyone like comment, he can comment with Dr. Adi and Dr. Uh, uh, Mustafa. So we will start with Professor Emer. He will speak about subject, which is now, it's like a, uh, something which is going up. Still many uh, speaking about that, who is right, what is approved or not approved, what can be done, what cannot be done, what is the FDA approved, what is the European approved, what is the most safe to the patients. I think he will uh, say to all of you in the next uh, lectures, uh, what are these techniques, how beneficial it is, and especially when used, which is very important, when said to the viewer patient, go to do anti reflux endoscopic modality. And then after that, we will have Dr. Ezzet who will speak about non invasive treatment of curl. And I think this is also a subject because there are many questions about maintenance, about high dose, about the nocturnal. So there are many questions about curl during uh, drugs use. So I try, I think Dr. Ezzet will, will be uh, more than sufficient to respond to all that. And then you have a break. And then we'll go to Andor. So uh, uh, from the beginning now, I like to uh, uh, ask uh, Professor Omer to start this lecture about endoscopic anti-reflux modality, which I think is a very good subject. I'd like to ask all the lawyer uh, to thank all the lawyer team. As I said before, when you have uh, four pictures on uh, on the webinar, there are about more than 10 people working behind the webinar, or more. So uh, it's like easy for us uh, that you, everyone is calm, but there is many people working behind us to this, and the picture are not there. They are, uh, they are not, we don't see them, and also the audience don't see them. But I think all these people who create the success, and also I like to thank Soroya for creations, a new technology and also a new idea about this webinar. I like to all moderators and I like the audience. And we start to hope now. Now it is uh, about 10 minutes after the beginning, so we have maybe 10 minutes delay, but which is very good. So uh, please, Professor Emel, can you start your lecture with the scopic anti reflux modality? And you are waiting at the end for lecture. Please, you can start. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Hope I am. So thank you, Professor Mustafa. And uh, thank you, Roya, for this opportunity to, and the invitation to share my views about 
endoscopic anti-reflex modalities, which I believe is an important topic. So good afternoon to all my friends in Egypt and uh, also a good evening to my friends in India, some of them who have joined. So we will start this uh, presentation now. So let us start with the goals in treatment of GERD. And we know, we are all aware that there are several unmet goals in the treatment of GERD. As we know that proton pump inhibitors are the standard of care for treatment of GERD, but we also know that there are nearly up to 40% patients may not respond or may only have a partial response. And it is also, PPIs are less effective to treat extraesophageal symptoms or regurgitation. There are also safety concerns about their long-term usage and also a cost in the, uh, you know, there are concerns about cost because of the long-term duration of therapy. So when we're talking about refractory GERD, and refractory GERD means those patients who either do not respond to PPIs or in other words, who do not wish to continue PPIs on a long-term basis. What options do we have? And we obviously have the standard of care anti-reflux surgical options, either open or laparoscopic, and a variety of fundoplication techniques are available, the Nissen, DAR, or the Tupe. And then we, of course, have the endoscopic anti-reflux modalities, which are nowadays coming up really in a big way. So let us look at anti-reflux surgery. At long-term follow-up, up to 25% of patients after anti-reflux surgery are known to restart their proton pump inhibitors, and re-intervention may be required in up to 30% of these patients. Common adverse events are that of dysphagia and bloating and flatulence, and of course, the procedure is invasive. And the LOTUS trial, which almost a decade ago, this was actually a landmark trial because what it showed was that at five years, remission rates between those patients who were on PPI versus uh, surgical uh, patients, patients who underwent anti-reflux surgery, there was no significant difference. And the severity of symptoms, if we compare that and the prevalence, Heartburn and acid regurgitation were more common in the PPI group, but dysphagia, bloating, and flatulence was more common in the surgery group. And adverse events were similar in both the groups. And what this showed us is that the conclusions were that most patients achieve and maintain remission at around five years using either PPIs or surgery. So yeah, it, it's important to understand that GERD is a chronic relapsing disorder, and possibly a single one-time intervention may not provide lifelong protection. And therefore, interval interventions and or along with medications may be required from time to time. And these were the lessons, very important lessons that we all of us learned from the Lotus trial. So because of that, endoscopic anti-reflux modalities have been popular for the last two decades or so. And these were the first generation devices which came about two decades ago. However, all of them fell into disrepute either because of their poor efficacy or safety or durability in long-term studies. And all of these were discontinued. However, currently the second generation endoscopic anti-reflux modalities which we have available currently are either the radio frequency ablation, or what is also called as the stretch-up procedure. Then we have the transoral fundoplication, which either actually has three, three types of devices which have been devised, either the Esofix device, or the Muse device, or the Gerdex device. And then we have mucosal resection or ablation technologies like anti-reflux mucosa. And we will discuss about these modalities in the coming few minutes. So let us start with radio frequency ablation or the strata procedure. So what is this procedure? This, this actually is a four needle balloon kind of a system. So the device is introduced under endoscopic guidance over a guide wire into the esophagus. 
and it is positioned across the lower esophageal sphincter. Radio frequency energy is applied to the lower esophageal sphincter muscle and the gastric cardia. And multiple applications, up to 14, are applied by rotating the catheter and pulling, in a, pulling the device in and out and extracting the needles out so that the needles actually go into the submucosa, you inject, and then the low power energy is applied using either a thermocouple and a water irrigation system so that uh, the temperature is well controlled. The temperature at the muscle level is around 65 to 85 degrees centigrade. And at the mucosa, it is only about 50, 50 degrees centigrade because of which there is very minimal mucosal damage. And the mechanism of action is that because of the radio frequency ablation, there is hypertrophy of the muscularis propria layer. There is reduction in the transient lower receptor sphincter relaxations, and there is also some fibrosis which improves the lower receptor sphincter tone. So this is how it works. Now coming to the results of the setup procedure, the first long-term follow-up study of 10 years revealed very impressive results: that of normalization of uh, the GERD quality of life scores to about 72% and reduction in PPI usage more than 50% in about 64% patients. However, STRETA has been probably the most extensively studied. At the same time, it is also one of the most controversial procedures because uh, of what I'm going to be telling you. So the initial re review and meta-analysis consisted of 20 studies, but all of them were single-arm studies and of, uh, included about 1,400 odd patients. And the pooled results showed a very impressive results in terms of improved heartburn scores, improved quality of life scores, improvement in reflux and dyspepsia score, and even the acid exposure reduced significantly in all these patients. However, in the second leg of the STRETA studies, what we realized that there were four randomized studies, three utilizing STRETA versus SHAM and one, one STRETA versus PPI, 165 patients. And what they showed was that all of these parameters, mean pH uh, percentage time, pH below 24 hours, below four and 24 hours, mean LES pressures, ability to stop PPI, all these three were actually the same, whether very nearly the same, whether we were using STRETA or sham or ppi however quality of life scores of ppi were far superior for the strata procedure indicating that this could be a more of a placebo effect and there was a, that was that is one of the reasons why strata in between was kind of uh, not preferred by many people but the third leg of the procedure now in the studies there are 20 studies in the last six or seven years which have predominantly uh, included four randomized control trials, 23 cohort studies, and even one registry of nearly two and a half thousand patients, and a mean follow-up of more than two years. And the pooled results definitely show, so the, the first slide was 100% efficacy almost, second slide was nearly no efficacy, and here probably the, the procedure is settling down now, and what we are trying to get is, you know, there is an improvement in the quality of life score, reduce, reduction or improvement of the hard one standardization score, PPI re requirement of follow-up is around 50 49%, reduced incidence of erosive esophagitis in about 24%, and acid exposure is reduced by a mean three uh, points, and the basal pressure is increased by a mean 1.73 millimeters. So, now the results are coming more and more standardization and more understanding is you know, we are getting some more understanding about this procedure. So this is what it is about STETA. Now coming to the next procedure, which is the transoral incisionless fundoplication or the TIF procedure, which is marketed by the endogastric solutions uh, company. It is also called the ESOFIX device. What this device does, it is a sleeve kind of a device which, inter, which can be introduced over the endoscope and the endoscope goes inside the, through this and then it can be retroflexed in the cardia 
and the procedure can be monitored while the procedure is being done along with this device. So what it does, it creates a 270 degree wrap below the gastroesophageal junction in this fashion. And even a hiatal hernia up to two centimeters can be reduced. It is an outpatient procedure to be performed under general anesthesia. And up to 20 H-type proline fasteners are actually inserted for a full thickness repair. So these kind of fasteners are applied and that is what, that is how it looks like. So results of TIFF, now looking, looking at that, there are five randomized studies with two systematic reviews. And the systematic review contains 18 studies of more than 900 patients. And the pooled relative risk of response rate to TIFF versus PPI or sham is around 2.44% of the time. So the, that is on an intention to treat analysis. And what it definitely suggests that the total reflux episodes are definitely reduced after the TIF procedure. However, there was no difference that was seen in the esophageal, you know, the acid exposure time as well as the acid reflux episodes. And the PPI requirement increased over time during the follow up. And there were about 2.5% of serious adverse events in these patients. At the long term, PPIs could be stopped or halved in about 87 to 88% of patients at, and then it reduced to around 84% at three years. And the response was reasonably stable up to six years. And comparing TIF with anti-reflux surgery, the efficacy was considered to be similar for both, although procedure time and length of stay was much superior for the TIF procedure. Coming to the Medigus ultrasonic surgical endostapler or the MUSE procedure. Now this is an Israeli device uh, which consists of a special dedicated endoscope. This endoscope has only an upturn which is a 360 degree upturn with a very strong, um, uh, you know, uh, strong uh, uh, compression between the tip of the device and the anvil. So there is an anvil and also the stapling device, which is fixed into the endoscope itself. And it also has an ultrasonic range finder. So this is the anvil and this is the stapling side and this is the anvil. And the entire system comes as it is. And the endoscope is a disposable endoscope. And how is the procedure performed? The endoscope is advanced to the gastroesophageal junction over here, you can see that, and the distance is measured. Then it is advanced further down into the stomach and it is retroflexed to visualize the gastroesophageal junction. Once the gastroesophageal junction is visualized on a computer, you can ex exactly measure how much distance one has to pull back. And we pull back the device so that we compress against the fundus, and the fundus is pushed back against the endoscope and the in the esophagus screws are fired first to stabilize the position and then five staplers in three rows are fired to staple the fundus to the distal end of the, of the esophagus here you can see that the stapler is being fired now this is performed at three locations in order to create a, approximately a 180 degree wrap and that is how it looks. I immediately at the end of the procedure, there is significant edema and uh, at the same time, a good uh, rich formation and a wrap formation at the G-junction. So the uh, prospective multicenter study demonstrated significant improvement in quality of life scores at about 73% patients at six months. And the PPI usage uh, demonstrated that 65% could completely discontinue and 56% was significant dose reduction and acid exposure time reduced at six months. Long-term results at four years demonstrated that nearly 70% patients were off PPIs and there was significant reduction in the PPI requirement and quality of life scores over at four years as well. So this was uh, what the MUSE uh, demonstrated. Coming to the third procedure, that is endoscopic full thickness plication or the GERDEX procedure. 
this again comes from G search and it has evolved from uh, an older device of the plicator, which was later on discontinued, but this is probably a modification and an improved modification of the plicator device. The concept is to create a robust anti reflux valve. So, what it does is now this again is like a device which incorporates the endoscope, a slim endoscope. So the device is introduced into the stomach and the endoscope is read, passed through it and then retroflex. And here at, on retroflexion, you can see the endoscope exiting the cardia. And there, using a tissue helix device, we pull in the, the tissue and then we apply this uh, 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 pledget using uh, the proline, the, the proline uh, suture and a pledget. So this creates a plication. So here is the actual procedure. Now you can see that we pass in a guide wire first, and we, we have to use a, an ultra slim transnasal endoscope. The device is passed over the guide wire, and then the endoscope is passed through the, the device. And here you can see this is the device, and that is the endoscope behind the device. And we are visualizing it, and this is the upturn of the device now i'll just forward the video a little bit here you can see it better so now the tissue helix is being uh, applied and that is the first this is the tissue helix now the first pleasure has already been fired now here the tissue helix is pulling in the tissue and then once the tissue is pulled in adequately we close the device using the handle and then the pleasures are fired There you can see that the pleasures are being fired. And either two or three pleasures can be applied so as to create a nice wrap. Here you can see the final outcome of the procedure once the device has been opened up. There you can see that a nice ridge has been created. Results of GERDEX, so third, uh, 36 patient study, prospective study with one year follow-up demonstrated symptom improvement in 92% and PPAs could be discontinued in 89%. And there was significant reduction in the acid exposure time. A multi-center study with a six-month follow-up again demonstrated quality of life improvement more than 50% in 75% patients and PPIs could be discontinued in about 70% and the results persisted at a one-year follow-up. Another prospective randomized study demonstrated your, which used DMASTER scores as well as the, uh, you know, the earliest mean pressures, you can see that the demister scores have not changed much. This is the plicator and this is the surgery. And this is again the plicator and the surgery. So there is not much of difference between the pre and post scores in, on the GEDEX side. However, we can see that the quality of life scores are significantly higher in the blood side as compared to, you know, and almost similar to that that we can see in the surgical side. Therefore, a placebo effect is quite likely. However, what is important to note is that dysphagia was much lower with the blood device as compared to the surgical arm. And that is the reason the conclusions of the study were that the general symptom scores were quite similar and there was stronger acid control and more effective reflux uh, symptoms. Controlled by the surgical group device. So this was the decision. Now coming to the resection procedures or anti-reflux mucosectomy, we all know that mucosal healing after mucosal resection, or uh, either EMR or ESD, occurs by secondary intention and it results in scar formation. Therefore, 
what prefers the professor in no device is a crescentric mucosal in resection below the gastrointestinal junction involving about 75 to 80% of the circumference and the resultant wound contracts due to fibrosis and scarring and this leads to remodeling of the g junction and this fibrosis results in shrinkage and remodeling of the gastric cardia flap valve thereby reducing the reflux events so here we are using a cap emr technique we have seen over here that we have injected in the submucosa and we are creating a cap emr and subsequently we can we will create a gap emr of nearly 75 to 80% of the circumference it is very important in this technique to remember how much mucosa to leave behind because if we leave behind too much then the procedure is unlikely to be effective but if we leave behind too little then the patient has a risk of developing a stricture so approximately what what has been described is 1.5 to 2 times the circumference of the endoscope on retroflexion is what is considered to be the most optimum so here you can see we have performed the complete resection and hemostasis is being performed using a coag grasper and that is the final result at the end of the procedure what is another important aspect that we need to inform our patients who undergo arms procedure is that as compared to the other devices the other procedures where the result is going to be immediate probably the next day onwards in arms the, the result will uh, will be assessed by the patient only after about 4 to 6 weeks once complete healing and remodeling occurs so until then patients have to continue on ppis but this is what the final result is expected to be this is the pre and this is the post and you can see that you can get an excellent closure of the les and a tightly gripping les around the endoscope using the arms procedure the pilot study of arms which professor inoy presented you know had ten, consisted of 10 patients with a reduction in acid exposure time in all of them and pps could be discontinued at all and the flap valve also improved in all subsequently professor you know this was another publication from his group at ddw which was presented where a technical modification was presented a butterfly shaped resection instead of a crescentric resection was presented which led to less stricture formation so in 67% there was significant improvement in the flap valve grade f scale and 24 hour ph results as well and pps could be stopped in up to 55% reduction reduced in 23% at uh, two months and 61% patients were completely off ppis at one year we also presented our data at dtw two years ago on 15 patients with a six month follow up and we reported that all these three parameters quality of life scores demister scores and the hills flap valve grade all of them significantly improved in the post arms period after this procedure and as far as the ppi usage is concerned we demonstrated that 11 out of our 15 patients were off ppis and all the four of them were using ppis three of them had you know, the usage was more than 50% reduction as compared to what was earlier and over two years it further reduced and two one more patient started consuming ppis on a regular basis so even at the end of two years about six months we found that the results were around 86% in favor of the procedure for the prevention of gerd long term results of arms currently this procedure probably does have its limitations because over a period of time we have found that more and more patients are starting to consume ppis our current database is about 36 patients and the three year follow up on the first 15 patients two were lost to follow up two had recurrent symptoms and underwent surgery however on an intention to treat analysis 53% patients are symptom free at the end of three years and are off ppis 
we also believe that there would be a, probably a, some kind of a learning curve when wherein you know if we can ascertain the amount of mucosa which is the most optimum to be left behind then probably these results could be improved upon and there still needs to be some more guidelines on this a further modification of arms is the arma or the anti reflux mucosal ablation here instead of resection what is created is a mucosal ablation using a triangular tip knife and a spray coagulation and a butterfly shaped ablation of the mucosa is performed and this initial case series of seven patients from professor inoy's group demonstrated very impressive results as compared uh, with regards to all these parameters i would like to touch upon a specific topic of very important interest currently in the entire endoscopy world which is of post poem reflux because i think poem is a procedure which has really become very popular in the last one decade a lot of centers have started performing poem and in the last few years there is an there has been an alarming concern about the gerd after poem the early data reported very less amount of gerd about 8 to 12% the recent data shows even up to 50% gerd based on ps studies uh, after poem and to the extent that it prompted an editorial in endoscopy will reflux kill poem and this has been a major concern and though for those of you who may be performing poem a few pointers how to prevent gerd while performing poem so this is the poem procedure and this important paper from tanaka et al which was published 2 years ago whenever we are performing a posterior poem this is at the gastrointestinal junction so these are perforator vessels and on the left side of the perforator vessels you can see these are the sling fibers therefore what is important to understand is that the myotomy should extend only onto the circular fibers and not extend towards the left of these perforating vessels so this is the line of the myotomy and one should not extend the myotomy towards the left while we are performing a posterior poem that is a very important aspect the second aspect is So the gastric aspect of the myotomy should not extend beyond two centimeters. If an extensive gastric myotomy is performed, that can increase the incidence of GERD post poem. And a third procedure and third aspect which Professor Inoue described, and we have worked more on that, is a poem MF or a new procedure where in a one stage single stage endoscopic fundoplication is performed after. performing the poem an anterior poem so after an anterior poem the peritoneum is opened and an endo loop and clip mechanism is used i will show you this in a video for so an anterior poem is for, for performed by submucosal incision i got injection and incision at 12 o'clock and we perform the poem in a standard fashion this is submucosal dissection followed by an anterior myotomy which is a full thickness myotomy and once the myotomy is completed what we do is we pass in a transnasal endoscope alongside the gastroscope which is sitting in the tunnel and the peritoneum on top of this mucosa of the muscle layer now here we can see the slim scope being inserted and here you can see the light trans elimination from the gastroscope inside the tunnel now we can um, open the peritoneum deep to the muscle layer and we will see the left lobe of the liver so this is a nodes procedure now we are going to be entering the peritoneal cavity and that is the liver with the peritoneal layer over there and we are entered the peritoneal cavity now once we enter into the peritoneal cavity the gastroscope is turned upwards and leftwards to approach the gastric fundus and you can see the spleen liver and the diaphragm and there is the stomach we catch hold of the fundus and we simulate a wrap so this is a, a grasper that we are using and we are simulating a wrap while monitoring 
on the slim endoscope view and here you can see a wrap being formed so once we are comfortable and we are happy with this wrap we mark that position using a soft coagulation current over here and if we withdraw the endoscope we fix an endo loop we hold the endo loop outside the scope using a clip and we carry that endo loop down through the tunnel into the peritoneal cavity and we fix the endo loop onto the gastric fundus three or four clips are applied onto the endo loop on the gastric side to fix it securely there's a third clip in fire and now we pull the endoscope back into the tunnel and we fix the proximal end of the loop to the distal end of the myotomy and the peritoneal opening once that has been done the endo loop is tightened and you can see the wrap being formed over here very effectively the tails of the endo loop are trimmed and following that we can close the mucosal incision as usual and that is how the wrap is being seen so results of omf and this actually we will be uh, you know the paper is currently under peer review so in 23 patients this is our paper with a mean age of 41 years and uh, the total procedure time was around 77 minutes with an and you know the fund application time which was added was about 42 minutes no major adverse events were found the median follow up is actually this is more now this is about 12 months and as far as the dysphagia was concerned there was significant improvement but what is important to understand is the wrap was maintained on follow up in about 86% of patients erosive esophagitis was seen in only about 18% the dean list scores actually revealed that only in about 11% patients had abnormal dean list scores and the gerd q scores were normal in 95% of patients and the overall incidence of reflux in these patients was about 11% as compared to what has been currently discussed about poem which is about anywhere between 30 to 50% so there was significant improvement in the gerd incidence so basically this gives us an overview about all the anti reflux modalities but now let us come to the comparisons so when we compare strata with tif and muse we can see that treatment response is very variable for the strata as well as for the tif but probably more predictable for the muse device the variation the variability is much lesser the durability of response has been assessed maximum for strata but lesser for these two options normalization of acid exposure is again 5 to 75% 37 to 89% and around 37% so still is anybody's game and serious adverse events can occur although they are quite rare so advantages of endoscopic anti reflux modalities and the limitations currently if we have to see that these all these procedures are emerging non invasive or minimal invasive options for gerd therapy the adverse events are minimal and overall the length of stay in hospital is much reduced their major limitations are that most of these procedures are applicable whenever there is no hiatal hernia or a very small hiatal hernia less than 2 cm and a hills flap valve of 1 or 2 for um, more loose or lax las probably these procedures are not that effective the symptom response is good however objective evidence in form of ps studies and the improvement in acid exposure time is still lacking and acid exposure time may be reduced but it is still not normalized in many of these studies the ppi usage has also diminished but it has not been completely eliminated and the long term data is still insufficient we still don't have any comparative studies between the different types of the endoscopic anti reflux modalities that is still definitely something that we very much desire and majority of these devices are quite expensive they have a learning curve 
and also may not be available for regular use. They're only available through clinical trials. So that is still probably some challenges. However, if we were to look for some time beyond the device and the technique regarding the anti-reflux modalities, I think there is a lot of things that we need to look at very importantly. And that is the first thing starts with a careful patient selection. And that this is important because many of our patients may have a complication of non-ulcer dyspepsia, reflux, eosinophilic esophagitis, and so many other esophageal hypersensitivity and so many you know, complex disorders. So GERD is, as a disorder, it is very difficult to diagnose confirmatorily. And unless we confidently can diagnose GERD, one should not offer them any kind of an anti-reflux modality therapy just blanket or blindly. So a pre-procedure evaluation, which is mandatory, it would include an endoscopy to assess for a hiatal hernia as well as a hill flap valve, possibly an esophageal biopsy to rule out esophagitis, a pH metry, ideally including impedance and an esophageal manometry, and quality of life scores, which should be taken on as well as off PPIs with a one-week gap, and these patients should definitely be exclusions for any kind of an endoscopic anti-reflux procedure. Those with large hiatal hernia, more than two to three centimeters, patients with a Hills valve of three or four, patients with severe esophagitis, grade C or D, or those with presence of Barrett's, patients who test negative on a pH study, patients who, uh, who may have an ineffective esophageal peristalsis because they can land up with dysphagia post-procedure, and patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, these are definite exclusions. So therefore, to summarize, PPI is still, I believe, found the mainstay of therapy for a GERD. However, one third of these patients may require additional therapy. I'm sure Professor Izzat will be discussing more about PPI therapy in his lecture. Anti-reflux surgery, either open or laparoscopic, still remains the gold standard for non-responsive GERD. Long-term response rates and adverse events are similar for anti-reflux surgery and for PPIs. And what is important to understand is that GERD is a lifestyle-related relapsing disorder, and therefore goal, uh, the goal of a single one-time solution may not be achievable. Endoscopic anti-reflux modalities are attractive, emerging, minimally invasive options for the treatment of GERD, which is non-responsive to PPI therapy. And the early results of these modalities are promising, but they need a very cautious interpretation. That is very important to understand. The wide variability in clinical results from different studies makes interpretation very difficult. The long-term subjective clinical response is encouraging. However, it needs to be backed up with objective evidence, which still it is lacking. The choice between types of endoscopic anti-reflux modalities is still very much debatable and possibly POMF is a promising nurse procedure for treatment of post-POM reflux, which requires further study. With this, I would like to extend a warm invitation to all of y'all to visit Pune, either if conditions permit, physically, otherwise virtually. We hold this course every year, so we had this last month, and next year we will have, we have this in April. So do try and make it convenient to attend, and please visit our website for more details. Thank you so much, and uh, once again, thank you, Roya, and thank you, Professor Mustafa, for this kind invitation and opportunity. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Amila, for this very, very, very uh, informative uh, lectures up to date, all the techniques, all the new published data. So, uh, I think we get uh, uh, many uh, ideas, and also we have many questions. But we will leave that uh, to the end of the to the end of the the end of the meeting because I think there are many people who like to ask about that. So uh, I'd like to thank you first and then we will see uh, at the end because myself I have some questions to you.
but I, 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 I will wait for the end to give uh, all the questions and the answer. So now we will go to uh, a techniques, uh, which is uh, not a techniques, but techniques of uh, print, how to use uh, uh, PBI, when to use, for how long, mm -hmm. uh, what is a non-invasive treatment, and uh, there are many uh, uh, unmet need in this area, uh, like what he said, Professor Emil, about use endoscopic management. So we'll go uh, to go to buy this one by Professor uh, Erzat Ali from Alexandria. He will present us uh, also uh, up to date level of this uh, subject of non intervention management of gut. Please, Dr. Hazard. You hear me now? Yes. Um, first of all, uh, thanks, Professor uh, Prahim uh, Mustafa, uh, for his kind uh, invitation, and thanks, Roya, uh, for this uh, activity for a long time since COVID uh, zone start. And also thanks for uh, AstraZeneca for uh, continuous medical education program. They working on it. Uh, my talk is about non-intervention and management of gout using different guidelines and consensus. We know that we have since 2013, 15, 17, and 14 and 60, 16, we have different uh, guidelines and different consensus, but we have to uh, select what, which will be appropriate for us to use and how to pass through these um, complicated guidelines to manage it in what's called the clinical approach. First, we will pass through uh, outline uh, definition of GERD and epidemiology, little about diagnosis, but in details about GERD management, refractory GERD. All of us, we know that the GERD is established as a condition under Montreal definition uh, when the reflux of symptom content causes troublesome symptoms and or complication. I mean that the troublesome symptoms and complication should be presented to discuss the problem of GERD. We know established the esophageal syndromes uh, as regarding the Montreal definition. We have a symptomatic syndromes, a typical reflux or reflux chest pain, and syndromes of esophageal injury, like esophagitis, reflux, stricture, barrett esophagus, up to adenocarcinoma. On the opposite, that is the extra esophageal syndrome with two types. Some become established, like reflux cough, laryngitis, asthma, and dental erosion, and some proposed, I think, pharyngitis, one of them now shifted, but sinusitis and IBF and otitis media in children, especially now, become an emerging. We have, as regarding old fashioned theory, GERD in a two type, NERD and ERD, or what's called erosive esophagitis, at a 40% and NERD 60%. This erosive type, 35% is a classic erosive and 5% is a complicated reflux disease. This is an old fashioned, but now we are talking about the new. Uh, phenotypes, we, ha we, we, we mentioned now that GERD is a, a different established phenotype from the start. We find that the NERD continue at NERD, and ERD continue at ERD, and we commonly find the parrot as a parrot. So they said there are some shifting about the uh, cascade and the passage of uh, from NERD to ERD, even to complicated time. That is uh, what we use in endoscopy common, that is the Los Angeles classification for uh, esophagitis using grid A, B, C, G, according to the zone of mucosal breaks, which become in A uh, no longer than five millimeter. When we pass to G, it involves more than 75% of the esophageal uh, circumference. And we, we never forget, as we said, the complication which old before years that they are uh, running by time, esophagitis, stricture, uh, parathoscopicus, and esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now, as I said, uh, at New Year's, they considered as different phenotypes. According when passing through this consensus, as we said from the start, all of them, all of them said that symptoms, 
and complication are the main to be in the zone of GERD and to be what's called uh, a troublesome disease to be treated. All of what we have from different consensus or even uh, guidelines. But by time we find that there is global prevalence of GERD become significantly increases. We have three zones, high, moderate, and low, and we consider uh, Africa as data of insufficiency up till now, according to the prevalence. But the area of high prevalence is North America, Australia, and North Europe, to a moderate degree, West Asia, South Asia, and South America. If we consider us as an East Asia or even Middle East, we said that uh, maybe in what's called low level, but with the data is insufficient as regarding the regist. What is established that GERD prevalence is still underestimated because heart turn sufferer, we find that 44% of them used antacid eligible, 18% consulted pharmacists, and only 56% consulted a physician. That is what is called the gap and delay to make full, full uh, assessment of prevalence. Also, it is established now that five years, we have more and more data making GERD gradually increase at any level of consensus and any level of guidelines. And look at this, in the last uh, 30 years, we are shifting as regarding endoscopic finding of GERD and even the symptom of GERD from 1.6 at 80s. Uh, at 2010, we reach up to 20% and 13%. Now, we established talks about prevalence of GERD increased by years. Commonly, we're making GERD as a symptom based. But this symptom based sometimes needs some help. So, diagnosis of GERD, when we consider symptom assessment, we said that symptom-based uh, diagnosis is an effective on the basis of management of GERD, and system-based gastrosophageal reflux questionnaire is a simple, tool, a simple tool with high diagnostic accuracy. Sometimes we need what's called preliminary diagnostic approach, which is called, that is, PBI test. This is a PBI test recommended at some times as an approach which with a mutated GERD or suspected reflux disease. And this PBI test is convenient, feasible, and non-invasive. By time, if the patient suffering more and more, we may need some help to exclude gastrointestinal non-GERD causes. But never forget, when you find that the red alarm symptoms or signs, you should pass directly to more and more deep investigation, especially dysphagia or dynophagia, hemorrhage, anemia, marasmus in babies uh, or, or young uh, childhood, repeated vomiting, weight loss, unexplained anemia. Never forget this. And by time, if the patient is more and more sufferer in a male sex with obesity, smoking at age about 50, looking for under changes like parrot. Rarely to use pH metry and impedance in uh, a GERD, especially uh, we shifted to it in a uh, refractory uh, type at some times, some PR. So, symptom based, that is very important to know that if the heart pain considered at 101, representing a patient of GERD. That is very important to know the scale of symptoms. You shift that you find that heart pain is about in up to 100% in patient with uh, GERD, and you, you you should know that is with esophagitis is more heart pain. Without esophagitis is less heart pain. And looking for the next one is epigastric pain, regurgitation, less with uh, bleaching, nausea, abdominal pain in general, and bloating. So when you depend on symptoms. All the guidelines and the consensus established the heart burn is a typical symptom of GERD. And never forget, up till now, GERD is a symptom-based disease. 
and looking for this when you depend on heartburn and sometimes regurgitation the diagnostic value is so good with a sensitivity up to 76 percent and specificity up to 96 uh, percent it's very good when you depend on uh, symptoms as regarding specificity and sensitivity even in extra esophageal GERD syndromes never forget that the triple of problems that all guidelines say that cough asthma laryngitis are established synd syndromes or extra esophageal GERD. The PPI test is a simple test, it's a therapeutic test. We, we sometimes use it depending on its convenient and feasibility and non invasive therapy. High sensitivity test initiates treatment as a time of diagnosing of GERD. Relief of upper gastrointestinal symptoms is good and it is a cost effective. And for example, drug like ismoprazole showing a potent and fast in acid suppression with more than two uh, hours, significant prolongation of intragastric pH more than four within 24 hours at a dose of 40. That is, if we use it, we find rapid response at 40 milligram with all response to symptoms as regarding heart pair. That is a correlation between symptoms drive and drug response or BBI test, making that empiric medical therapy using BBI as simple test and the therapeutic uh, behavior is good in all consensus up to uh, uh, three years before. Also, uh, even in non cardiac chest pain, one of the big syndrome, especially in patients with GERD, that is the chest pain, but never forget first to rule out all cardiac factor. And if you rule it by time, you will find the persistence of non-cardiac chest pain, PBI test may be a triable. Also, extra esophageal GERD and BBI test can be used in all types, especially cough, laryngitis, and asthma. That is the PBI test sensitivity up to 87% and 73% specificity. Now we shift it to management of GERD. We know that to get the full good and goals to get it in management of GERD, you will pass up to measurement in the form of improved quality of life. So you have to get this medication, which make the, its response fast and sustained, and also healing the underlying osteogitis, and maintenance good to prevent symptoms and endoscopic remission, and treat or even stoppage or prevent complication. That is, the uh, uh, control of acid secretion is the most effective means to achieve these goals. And never forget that when you pass through the cascade of therapy in uh, GERD syndrome, you will pass from lifestyle intervention, medication, that is a big entity, and as Professor Amol said, endoscopic management versus anti-reflux, that is uh, all what we have now in treatment of GERD. When we're looking for lifestyle intervention, we have the triple of weight loss is an essential in all, and head bed elevation, avoidance of heavy meals two to three hours before bedtime, especially in patients with nocturnal GERD. Nocturnal GERD. But the routine global elimination of food that can trigger reflux is not recommended in the treatment of GERD. That is a very sophisticated behavior to avoid some foods, but we consider the smoking, it is the only one as regarding the behavior uh, changes should be applied in patient with GERD. That is the established in all guidelines and the consensus. That is the weight loss, that is the head elevation, that is the avoidance of heavy meal, and some of them add smoking and all of them considered as uh, well, uh, good evidence and highly recommended. As regarding the pharmacological therapy or non-interventional therapy, PBI standard treatment is important. We should know that is uh, acid control, direct correlation with symptom control and healing control. As you're looking here, you'll find by more and more time and more and more controlling the pH uh, intragastric pH above four, you will get symptom control and you will get what's called mucosal healing. So when you get both symptom control, mucosal healing, I think the quality of life will be uh, improved. 
that is the all consensus that the eight week course therapy of BBI is a choice, especially in relieving symptoms and the healing of erosive esophagitis. That is all consensus lines and all guidelines, including Chinese, Japanese, ACG, and WGO. So we consider that the standard BBI dose for eight weeks is the regime to start with. And this is come from the different studies showing the superiority of BBI versus H2 receptors, prokinetic agenates in relieving symptoms and in mucosal healing. Especially in long time use, we find that is more and more now we will discuss about it in side effects. For example, ismucrazole or what's called Nixium provided a potent and longer acid suppression and they maintained the intragastic pH more than four for a significantly longer time in, compar in comparison with the other BBI. Now we shift from establishing BBI to intra-BBI changes. We find that ismoprazole, one of the most potent and potent beside its efficacy is for longer time. And that is ismoprazole gain and maintain faster symptom resolution versus other PRPI. So it's potent, it's faster, it's act for longer time along the 24 hour. Even in healing, we said that the symptom is important, but by time, I should mention that reflux esophagitis become healed using ismoprazole when it compared with omeprazole, lansoprazole, and even lansoprazole. And you find that the patient healed at four weeks significantly high in all patients using uh, uh, ismoprazole or Nixium at 40. So now we have the standard course, eight week standard PBI therapy is recommended in all guidelines and the consensus and up to the four consensus we discussed in our lecture. Eight week PBI therapy reduces symptom relapse. Now we are shifting from number one, symptom control, number two, healing. Number three, as we discussed from the paradigm or the strategy of therapy, is to avoid what's called symptoms relapse. We find that eight week initial, of initial treatment with ismoprazole reduced symptom relapse compared with four weeks in patient with mild reflux esophagitis. Now, what about the long term? We have a long term debate also in long term strategies. We should know that the maintenance of BBI therapy should be administered for GERD patients who continue to have symptoms after BBI discontinuation. I mean, patient under treatment become controlled when you stop the patient become relaxed. And now they are discussing that is essentially and strongly recommended to you long-term BBI therapy, even at minimal dose in erosive esophagitis and parathyroidism. So, Long term, very important in two things. That is erosive esophagitis and the parathyroidism. And now we discuss that is can be used especially as a term called the in demand only in patient with mild GERD or even NERD. That All of what we said now is a strong recommendation or demand may be needed. So PPI maintenance sustained control GERD symptoms with result of about four, five years follow-up showed that ismoprazole 20 milligram maintenance, maintenance therapy provided effective long-term symptom control in patient with chronic GERD. I mean, you will discuss what about the long-term use versus complication, we know it. But at 2017 is a very important study about how to manage GERD evidence-based review and using the effectiveness and tolerability of different recommended doses of BBI using what's called network meta-analysis and grade system. Number one, when you're looking for the healing, you will find that is uh, looking at the upper part of the slide, you will find that is uh, reference references up to 3,000 or more, you will find that is ismoprazole, 40 milligram per day, showing the most strong one 
for hearing, and that is Cochrane Review also established that using Mipro-Ismoprazole at 40 milligram. When you come to symptom control, yes, the biggest from up to 3,000 to 6,000 references, Ismoprazole 40 milligram for symptom relief, and the Cochrane showing established one. And when we coming to the tolerance, you will find the Ismoprazole one of the strongest drugs showing high tolerance, especially in patients with GERD. Now we had the triple symptom healing tolerance, which helped us for long-term established also in Cochrane. When you discuss term refractory GERD, we have a different problem. That is the persistence of troublesome GERD symptoms, unresponsive to at least eight weeks PBI therapy, may be termed as a refractory GERD. Mostly of the recommendations come from different guidelines and consensus said like this, but sometimes they add about up to 12 weeks. And never forget, in, in that patient, you have to assess what's called the double dose assessment, and you find that Chinese consensus is good, and also in uh, Japanese. But you never forget that the difference, not in duration, eight weeks is the basal, standard dose 40 milligram is the basal, but a little about using in double dose BB3 forces, that is a refractory girl. The main causes of refractory girl consistent of insufficient inhibition of gastric acid, acidic or non-acidic reflux, non-GERD causes, and the reflux sensitivity. And never forget the first set action in patient with GERD when we said that is refractory and non-responsive is the adherence to medication. Adherence is one of the most important even before you start the assessment because we have reflux related abnormality like insufficient inhibition of gastric acid, non-acid reflux from the start or reflux sensitivity. And versus non-reflux related causes, please don't forget that esophageal dyskinesia syndrome like cardiac achalasia, sclerodermia, other esophagitis that is xenophilic infectious or even drug induced, and lastly, functional heart pain and functional chest pain. You have now, when you discuss about the refractory GERD symptoms, number one, assessment adherence, number two, dose of BBI, number three, duration of PBI if failure to control. Some terms we call it partial responder. We have another um, a new term, partial responder to PBI. We have something to, to do to helping him. But when you, you discuss about refractory GERD, you have discussed like this. Refractory GERD management using PBI, the first step, what's called optimization of the PBI therapy. What I mean by optimization, that is the full dose, full adherence, and sometimes it talk about switching. You may switch because what's called internal variation between different personnel versus different type of the PPR. When you use ABAR endoscopy, should be performed in patient with refractory gear with typical or dyspeptic symptoms, principally to exclude non-GERD etiology, which we mentioned before. In a patient in whom extra esophageal GERD persists despite PBI optimization, assessment for other etiology should be pursued through concomitant evaluation in EG pulmonary and allergy. Patient with refractory GERD and the negative evaluation by endoscopy or evaluation by ENG should undergo ambulatory BH monitoring, so you should pass through optimization then endoscopy, then assessment and consultation before shifting into ambulatory pH monitoring. Reflux monitoring of medication can be performed by any available modalities, especially pH or impedance pH, and testing on medication should be performed with impedance pH monitoring in order to enable the measurement of non-acidic reflux. Refractory patient with an objective evidence of ongoing reflux as the cause of symptoms should be considered for additional anti-reflux therapy. I mean, as Professor Amol said, we are in the zone, no step, no, one step is not enough. And now you should never forget 
adherence, optimization, full dose, or we consider it double dose before, and sometimes you need switching of that PBI. And for example, that is an example of switch patient on omeprazole, lanzoprazole, rebiprazole for eight weeks with the symptom persist. That is an example of switch. When you're shifting on ismoprazole, 40 milligram double dose for eight weeks, you will find that is before and at four weeks and eight weeks, there is a significant difference in changes in the frequency of reflux symptoms and change even in the grade of heart burn severity. Before we finish, never forget, we will discuss about long-term versus potential risk associated with PBI. Switching inside the PBI itself may be a play a role in the setting of side effect. Patient with known osteoporosis can remain on BBI. Concern for hip fracture and osteoporosis shouldn't affect the decision to use BBI long term, except in patient with other risk factors for hip fracture. Patient on BBI can be at risk for cholesterol difficile infection and should be used with care in patient at that risk. Short-term BBI usage may increase the risk of community-acquired pneumonia. The risk doesn't appear elevated in long-term use. PBI therapy doesn't need to alter the, in the concomitant corbido grail users as there doesn't appear to be an increased risk for adverse cardiovascular events. Conclusion as regarding the PBI. From the start, no therapy is completely without risk. With a pharmacological, surgical, psychological, no matter how begin or straightforward, consequently no drug, procedure or treatment delay should be ordered without a validated indication. The unparalleled safety of this PBI, it is an established as a class of drug. 25 years after their introduction into the clinical practice, PBI remained the mainstay of treatment of acid-related disorders, including gastroesophageal as the famous one. Overall, PBI are irreplaceable. We can replace them, we cannot replace them. Irreplaceable drug in the management of acid-related disease. Never forget, up till now, we have nothing which can kick off using BBI in treatment of the herpes. Adhering with an evidence-based guidelines represent only a rational approach to be effective and safe BBI therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Azad, for this uh, uh, full uh, explanations of using of how to manage GERD and also um, how to manage difficult cases, refractory cases, speak about maintenance, side effect, and you get all the subjects from all points and from all angles. So I think it's a very good uh, uh, lectures uh, to cover all the aspects of non-invasive management of GERD, either maintenance, either refractory or uh, erosive uh, doses uh, and everything. So. Thank you for that. I think uh, all of us has a coffee during these two uh, very eminent uh, lectures. And shall we go to the, the I mean, the new subjects, which is the era of uh, uh, new introductions of uh, uh, and on uh, on life. This is a new for me also. It's a new. So we will see how it will go. And also, any questions will come, we we'll try to answer them. And so we will start. Now we have Dr. Adi, Dr. Mustafa, and two nurses, but uh, I don't know the names, but they can present them. Uh, we hope that nurses without masks, because we like to see their faces uh, very good, uh, because the faces of females is nice to see it, but see the Mustafa and Adi still with the mask. So uh, we will leave them to give how uh, they make hand-on 
and we listen to them and I hope they can introduce all the team with them because I cannot see with the mask what is they are. So thank you very much. Please, uh, Dr. Adi and Dr. Mustafa, the first time I think on Middle East or maybe everywhere to make and on on life. So please go on. Uh, uh, Professor Brahim for, uh, for the presentation. Uh, so today, I really, I'm, I'm really excited to do uh, Maybe, uh, which I'm sure of, it's in the Middle East, so I'm going to do the hands on. Uh, so, simply today, that I'm uh, and broke up. the team uh, so we have a team to be able to do this today uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, professor Muhammad al adi my friend from now more than 25 years uh, to join us for the first uh, session uh, we have in the room here two nurses so uh, salma and rania uh, salma is our head nurse and rania is on from our team uh, from roya team so I will let Adi uh, do everything today. I will, not, I will do nothing. Uh, but on the other side, I would like to thank a few people behind the scene. So we have here, uh, for this broadcasting, we have uh, the team uh, from uh, Mawahib. So thank you, all of them. So really, they are doing great work to do all of this. From our team, from Roya team, um, everything is managed by uh, Dr. Nuran Rushdi. So she's my, really my uh, daughter. And she's doing a lot of work for all of this. Uh, also, I would like to ask uh, to thank uh, Marawan Ashraf, uh, our new, uh, uh, I would say, uh, runner in the team. So he's doing a lot of job in the back office. And lastly, uh, our new uh, cooperation with, uh, uh, with Tanzim Company. So they are helping us in this broadcasting to be in the professional way. So I would like to thank everyone. I will let Audi uh, to, to start. So please, Audi. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Ibrahim Mustafa for uh, uh, being with us. This is a very great honor for us and thanks to my great friend Mustafa. Uh, he's a like brother for me and I'd like also to thank uh, the two great nurses who are going to work with me. This is Salma and this is uh, Rania. And thanks to uh, Roya Training Center and AstraZeneca for uh, uh, doing this first virtual hands-on training. So, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about what I'm using now. This is a uh, uh, Roya module for... Uh, uh, Focus on the model now. This is a uh, Roya module for uh, uh, polypectomy. And uh, when I'm getting inside, I will tell you what's inside it. And the second thing, this is uh, the uh, Fuji uh, uh, system endoscopy, and this is the uh, five series uh, uh, upper endoscopy with 2.8 channel. And also I'm using some accessories, all of them are, uh, from Boston Scientific. So we will start with introducing the accessories uh, we are using now. Dr. So Adi, the first Dr. accessory Adi. we are using. Dr. Adi. Yes. yes. When you speak yes. a, a endoscope by 2.8 channel, Sometimes you can use a channel uh, endoscope with either a channel where it's enough for all the accessories. Well, according to the technique, uh, uh, the 2.8 channel is the least channel uh, in the upper endoscopy uh, uh, devices, but it's enough for most of the techniques except some minimal techniques like duodenal stenting or, or what's called uh, stenting through the scoop. But if you are doing techniques, like uh, uh, polypectomy that we are going today or doing EMR, it will be enough. Uh, okay, just uh, one comment before Audi starts. We have also for all the attendees, so please feel free to send questions. We have a new system here that this question will, be, will appear in front of us here, yes. and then we can answer your question uh, throughout the session. So please. Okay, okay the first uh, accessory I'm getting, I'm going to use here, this is the injector, the needle injector, and it's a uh, 200 centimeter lens, so it's working in the upper end of the scope. And uh, this is it's a 20 mucosal injection. I will help you. You can open it if the yes. 
So I think this is also uh, very important because in Egypt, especially in the viruses, we are accustomed the, to the 21 gauge needle, but for the polypectomy, you need a, a, a smaller needle. So you don't need a 21 gauge needle like the viruses. Uh, 23 is enough uh, for, for injection. One of the things also for this needle, the lock system. So you can see here uh, this thing that, so I, it, there is no, not, nothing to adjust. If you just push, so it will be locked. So if you can, please, if you can focus on, on, the, on the second hand here, Yes, we can yes, do it. You can do, you you can, can do it. Yes. yes. So, uh, yes, focus a little bit. Zoom a little bit. Yes. So, perfect. So, so it's only, if I go back, and then it's only the needle out. So, there is no, there is no uh, uh, any fear of doing uh, more or less. And you have the part, this part of the needle, that this is also another very important, especially when you are injecting, uh, really, especially in, maybe in viruses. Sometimes, you, need, you know, the needle breaks. So one of the good things in this injector needle that you have here, if I can focus this, so it can accommodate the, sear, the, the small syringe that they, are, they can fix. So you can fix the syringe here if needed. Uh, so this is regarding the injector needle. So please. Okay. Please. So the second accessory you are going to use, this is the Boston Scientific Captivator. And it is a, the large one with the medium stiffness wire. So you can see here, the specs here you can see 30 millimeters, which means this space you can focus here. So it's three centimeters, okay? And it's called the large oval because it's oval in shape and it's the largest. And it's medium stiffness wire. So I think the, another important, very important message that you should not do polypectomy. If not, you have different size of the snare. So this is a very big one. We have here, we are prepared for every, we have a lot of them. So you should, in, in the clinical setting, you should have different sizes of the snare. So this is, yes, I will focus. So you can see now, uh, yes, Adi is opening the snare and closing the snare. So I know, for example, I, I, have, uh, I have seen Professor Ibrahim uh, uh, years and years uh, uh, that when he, he was doing this, he always take, after catching the polyp, you always take the snare in your hand. What you do always, uh, uh, Adi? Well, uh, I want to mention something first. Uh, uh, knowing the measures of the tool that you use helps you to choose the right tool for polypectomy and also helps you to measure before doing. So if I'm opening it, it's now I know it's 30 millimeter. So I can measure the polyp. And even, even the, the sheath itself, it's 2.4 millimeter. So even the sheath itself, I can measure it. I can use it to use, know the elevation of the polyp. So if, this is 2.4 millimeter. So it's, if it's double, this means we have five millimeter elevation polyp, something like that. So every measure and every length we know about the tool, when it's closed or when it is open, it helps us in uh, uh, doing the right technique. Okay. And also Adi. we have Dr. Yes, Adi. Yes. Dr. Adi. Yes. You put a mark, you put a mark on the handle. You, you put on the snare itself. You put a you, you put a so you put a mark. You put a mark some, or not? Some people put um, mark here no. when they know this. No, I I because I, I, this I is really very know. important. Because this is very important because when you open it and close it, sometimes you can uh, uh, you know by this closing that you are closing the polyp, but if you, your nurse continue to close, it can catch the polyp without any polypectomy. So normally, we put a, a, a line when you open the snare and when you close it, when it reaches the end, you make a mark on the handle. Yes, it's, it's according to the experience of the uh, helping nurse, I think it, it, uh, it differs a lot. If, uh, if uh, she is an uh, expert nurse like we have, and even I can uh, uh, use my hand to know uh, how much length that I'm going in comparing to when it was closed uh, without a polyp. So this will help me to know if I'm closing partially or I'm closing uh, 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 totally. There was a question here I didn't see. And also here, we are having the uh, rescue net or retrieval net. The retrieval net is used to remove the resected polyp.
uh, this is the new tool, uh, the new baby from Boston Scientific. Uh, so this is the net. Yeah, you can open this, please. So uh, yes, this is the uh, the net to uh, to capture the resected part. And I think this is in Egypt is not very popular, but I, I encourage really everyone to have it because sometimes, especially in the colon, when you resect the polyp, and then you take a lot of time to retrieve the, the polyp itself. And, and I think this is one of the, of the very easy tools uh, to, re, uh, to retrieve big polyps. So it's, uh, I think it's now available in Egypt from Boston. Yes, and it's also important for uh, some foreign bodies uh, that cannot be removed easily with foreign body forceps or by snare or by a basket. I think like there's a question uh, coming balls. from the audience to you. Uh, do you use APC for marking in polypectomy? Well, uh, 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 actually in some cases, uh, if the polyp margins are very clear and the polyp size is around less than uh, 20 millimeters and you are doing polypectomy, not actually EMR, I do not use APC. If it's flat lesion and it's larger than 20 millimeter, I can use APC for marking, okay. yes. Thank you. So, yes. Okay, so I think we can ready. We are ready to start. Or only the uh, in the clips, uh, the uh... yes, yeah, we have the clip. Yes. So I, th I think this is another important thing, Adi, that you need to be prepared. So it's uh, sometimes when you are removing a polyp, you said, okay, I need only a snare. But you can see here, this is the things that you should have when you are ready for polypectomy. Yes, and this is uh, the resolution 360 rotatable clip from Boston Scientific, and as you can see. It's, it needs just working channel of 2.8 millimeter and it's 203 centimeter in length so it can work for colonoscope and for upper endoscopy. And we will open it now. So this is the, the, the one of the rotatable, uh, one of the rotatable uh, uh, clips. So I will, so this is, I'm opening the clip now. If you can focus on this hand, yes. And now I will just go beside him like this. And now I can rotate the clip from here. You can see, I can rotate the clip very one-to-one -one movement by this. This is the new version of the, of the resolution uh, clip. So you can uh, really adjust, and it's both direction. You can adjust uh, the, the direction before. And then when I will fire, I just scrap it. And then I will pull more than to, uh, to fire the clip. Yes. <coughs> So I think uh, we are ready now to start our procedure and yes, lamp. So we have a we have you will see the simulator now. We have a, a lot of uh, polyps. So uh, yeah, please if you can see the endoscopic view. I hope you can see the endoscopic yeah, image now. Please, with the control room, could you uh, shift for the endoscopic view? Yes, so make it bigger, please, so you can put the... Okay, so you can see now the polyps. So the, this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, really the beauty of the art of our uh, training manager, Nuran. She had a lot of polyps for us. She already <laughs> created a lot of polyps for us. So you are, you are, you are free to choose, Adia. So it's okay. Uh, first of all, these are artificial polyps that Dr. Nuran has uh, made for us. And of course, because they are uh, uh, artificial polyps, if we want to classify them according to first classification, they will all mostly have the same classification, which is uh, one PS, which are uh, sub pedunculated polyps, I think. Most of them are like this. So, uh, uh, I have some foreign body in front of the, Yeah, so now we will uh, try to do different scenarios for polypectomy. We will do a uh, simple polypectomy. We will try to uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, cold snare and hot snare uh, polypectomy. Uh, and we will uh, do uh, something like EMR after elevation of the lesion. And also we can talk about small polyps. If we do not, if we have smaller polyps less than uh, four millimeters, we can do uh, which is called forceps polypectomy. It's, it's without snare, it's just with uh, 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 the forceps. The second thing I want to say that the most important issues in polypectomy are uh, three issues. Number one, 
is try to avoid uh, or try to manage bleeding if it happens, try to avoid and manage perforation if it happens, and try to be complete resection. Because uh, 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 with increasing the size of the polyp, there is always higher risk of uh, complications and higher risk of residual lesion. So lesions above 20 millimeters uh, have a carry risk of 30% of incomplete resection. So we will now just say that... Uh, so which, which technique you will start? So the one you inject now, the first one, or you will do... Uh, I uh, think so we have a question coming for you. Which solution you use for injection now? Well, uh, uh, I use two, uh, two scenarios. The first scenario is just to inject uh, uh, saline, but this is in case of just I want to do good elevation, but I can see the margins. The margins are very clear for me. If the margins needs to be more clarified or to be sure that I can see them, I put diluted uh, 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 methylene blue with the saline. So I think we can inject first. Okay, so we will start injecting. So I think one of the scenarios that already Thelma has prepared for, for us here, this is important. So uh, you have multiple series. Huh? So you, sh you should, because sometimes when you inject, you have only, so this is also for your nurse should be ready with a lot of injection. So you don't put, you put, you put, don't put adrenaline. No, of course, I, 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 many people use it, but uh, I think it's just mechanical compression. It's better than uh, the water construction. One of the tips also, you need before you go to inside the scope to uh, fill the dead space. So I will ask Selma to open the needle. So needle out, inject. I will inject uh, before I go inside. Yes. This is very important that we already we are make sure that the needle is working. Second thing that uh, we have uh, filled the dead space with the with the injecting solution with the needle back. So please. So now now uh, uh, it's ready for injection. So I can go through the camera. Yeah. So could you have also the endoscopic okay. view, a bigger one, please? What you inject? Okay. Dr. Adi. What you inject? Dr. We Adi. will inject now. Uh, okay. We will inject now diluted methylene blue with saline. Yes, this is very important. What okay. what's the dilutions? So, what dilutions? The dilution it's it's different. Uh, actually, I think it's there is no uh, uh, guidelines. I think uh, guidelines no for, for fixed this. concentration. Yes. So it's uh, just for visibility for the doctor. But but for me, I want uh, one to ten. But it's not a fixed figure that uh, yes. I think it's written in any literature. Okay, so uh, you have the pulps now, Adi, in, in the, you can see the polyp in the, uh, in the middle of uh, your vision. So where, where you are going to inject first? Well, first, uh, the most important thing that always try to know uh, the scope you are using, which direction uh, the tools will come. So the tools here are coming from 6 o'clock, uh, 6 o'clock, uh, 6 p.m. o'clock, and this is very... Uh, 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 good position for us. So, uh, if I am using, it, if it's just a small polyp, which is means or medium-sized even polyp, less than one centimeter, I can uh, uh, in, inject just proximal, just here, just proximal, just I'm here. But if it's large polyp, I will start with the distal, the scope with the distal parts because it will be hidden if I inject here first. So if it's large polyp, uh, more than one centimeter, I will inject here first to do the elevation, then come and inject here. Okay. So uh, I think for this one, it's, uh, uh, it's if it's I'm going a small one, to huh? measure it, it's less than one centimeter, I think. So, uh, or around one centimeter, so it's not a large one. So I will inject just here. So I will tell Salma just to give me the needle now. Okay, put in mind that also this is that tissue, so we need to be a little, so it's sometimes in the, in the yes. patients, yes, yes, in the patient, we, we don't have to really pierce a lot, so we just pierce the mucosa, pierce, oh, yes, please. So, uh, 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 Dr. Mustafa is saying very important uh, uh, issue. This is a dead tissue. This is not human. So, elevation is not like the human. So, yes. inject. Inject. That's very good. But you can see the elevation. More. Yes. So stop. One so second. Just, this, yeah, this is very important. Salma did so because she don't have the mic, but she did. She need to tell Adi how much is injecting 
centimeter by centimeter. On the needle? Yes. Uh, so, yes. this is for a dead tissue, this is a very accepted elevation because the module uh, actually is working very good. So, now we have done the elevation. And uh, do, you, do you think God, you should you should have a second injection on, on at three three o'clock here? Mm. Just a smaller injection here. Well, I think yes. I need injection here at three o'clock. Yes. And also, I want to remind you that uh, she uh, those she is injecting methylene blue. It's not very clear here the color of the methylene blue, but in uh, live tissue, uh, uh, we 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 can see it very uh, clear. And uh, regarding the question that I can uh, question that I'm seeing now on the screen. How much I should inject? No, I inject till I am having good elevation from yes, uh, is, the old sides. This is very important. So, and and the, the, especially in bigger polyps, when you have really a big, uh, a big uh, lateral spreading tuber, which are going to yes. resect, I always inject piece by piece. You don't need to really to elevate smaller polyp like this. It's all okay. One injection is enough. But sometimes if it's a bigger polyp, I will inject, yes. resect, inject, resect uh, part by part. So give me the needle out now, please, Salma. Inject, please. Inject. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Enough. So pull the needle. So you see also, this is important in real life, that Adi, what did he, he always tell Salma, needle out, needle in. She will never take the needle unless he will say, but sometimes this is, sometimes when you, when you just push the needle or pull it, you have bleeding, and you don't, we don't need to have any minute bleeding now, because this is when we need to have a very clear vision. Which snare? So this is the big one. The big one. The small one. Maybe the smaller. Yes, because I think that we can have the smaller one. We are using also for a section today, RB machine. Uh, so we are using uh, uh, normally, yeah, again, this is a this simulator. So we're going to use uh, an, uh, a pure cut. Uh, however, in, 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 uh, in patients, we always use uh, either EndoCut Q uh, or I. It depends on the session. It depends on the hospital. But we use always blended carrot. So uh, we are using today uh, the RB generator. Yes. So now, as I, tell, uh, as I told you first, the, the, the diameter of this closed sheath is 2.4 millimeter. So it's almost quarter or less than, or, or around third to quarter the polyp. So this polyp is one, two, three. So this polyp is around eight millimeter as we can measure it here by using the diameter of the uh, sheath. So I will tell uh, Salma to open please gradually. And this is enough opening, and I can tell her now to close. But before telling her to close, while she is closing, I will just push, push the sheath forward in order to keep the ratio fixed. So Salma, please close gradually. No, open please, gradually. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Close, close. So yes. you, you, you have seen what Adi did. He was pushing the sheath. The same speed, like uh, Salma was closing the the the, the polyp to have uh, to catch the base of the polyp. Yes, and now in some polyps, but in not in this polyp. In some polyps, I used cold snare cutting, but in this polyp, it 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 does not have a, a, a pedicle that allow me to do uh, 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 this uh, cold snare. So I will do I will do hot snaring. The hot snaring uh, uh, is good for hemostasis but it can do some tissue injury so just we will do some elevation here very very light elevation to avoid more tissue injury and then i will start doing it so it's now we have done the resection the first of all what is the first thing you do after a section? Uh -huh. I inspect the sides. The base, yeah, the base. Yes. So, so this is very important. So the first thing you do is always, uh, because we are as, because we have a little bit of uh, excited because we have resected something, but do, leave the resected part and go for the base. Yes, I go for the base first. And uh, this is not human. This is uh, not the classic. So I will consider now that we are having perforation. Do you like this idea? Yes, yes, okay, this is good. So I will consider that this is a perforation and we want to close it. And after this, we will do retrieval for uh, the polyp. So I'm going to use now 
the uh, resolution clip. Okay, so uh, we have a question coming from the audience. Oh, did you recommend a distal cap uh, while performing polypectomy? Uh, so, in fact, yes, I, I prefer using the distal cap. I think I think I think uh, the cap, uh, especially in human settings, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, good things. One of them is that you uh, not only to position your scope well for the resection, but also it's very important for uh, controlling the bleeding before even the very minute bleeding at the base of the polyp, because with the cap. So I always have I will never do polypectomy nowadays without a CO2 pump without uh, uh, an automatic irrigation uh, and a cap. So I think the cap with the automatic irrigator, uh, 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 you have to clean the base and wash the base and you can identify very small vessels to be coagulated. Uh, the stimulator uh, that has a part, is a still, still no, I think, a no. small part it's maybe? The, no, it's our, no, this is the secret. <laughs> this is our secret where we, oh, this where is we fix, where, where, where ah. we fix. Yes, yes, yes. So this is, this uh, is artificial fixation. Just, yeah, this is artificial <laughs> fixation of yes, the quality. Yes, yes, yes. This is not incomplete resection. It's completed resection, but this is artificial fixation. So now I am going to tell Salma, please open. So Adi is simulating uh, uh, perforation and minute perforation, and he will close the perforation now. Yes, and I need some rotation from Salma, please. Yes, rotate the clip, rotate. So rotate you, see, you see, Salma did very important thing. She uh, straightened, straightened herself. Uh, she pulled the, the, she straightened herself being far from yes. Adi while she was rotating, and now she's rotating a very good position, I think. Yes, like I think this is a very good position, so. And you can see the, the, the by one clip, you are enough to have, if there is a perforation, a minute perforation, uh, we should not have perforation in a human patient, but again, Adi is simulating yes, the very please. extreme condition. Very good. Yes. So you can see Adi, what he did, he grasped the two edges of the of the of the perforation you can fire now and he filed the clip oh. okay and this is closure very good uh, uh, actually i will not retrieve the polyp because it is attached right no no it's not you can remove it. now i can't do you it. can oh, remove it no okay. problem <laughs> don't worry <laughs> neural is testing our 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 uh, techniques our our technical power so you we will use now the uh, to retrieve this uh, resected segment. So the tips of the rescue net, the, okay, what setting of the, the diet? Oh, okay, so no, here we are not using the, uh, the true uh, settings because uh, we are using a dead tissue. So in this part, in this here, we are using a very uh, a high, very high uh, auto cut mode, but in, but in human being, uh, normally uh, I will use uh, endocut Q with effect two. Uh, uh, but again, this is, it depends on many things. So I think uh, a lot of, uh, in the literature, a lot of settings for different polypectomy, so, but this is what we use for humans. Yes, please Salma, open gradually. More. Yes, enough. More, maybe more, a little bit more. Yes. Yes. So start closing, please. So you see what he did, he, he, he did the same like, the, he started distal Close. to the polyp. Close. Catching the polyp very, very close. Okay, very good. So now I catch it in the. Uh, so you will take uh, the scope retrieve. out. Huh? Yes, you take I will everything take, out. Sure, I will take yeah. the scope out. So, uh, yes. Okay, so now he is taking the scope out. You can show if you can change to the. Yes, the camera. Yes, yes. Yes. And this so is, can, as this we is, said, it's less than one centimeter polyp. And we, uh, when we want to take it out, I will tell my assistant Salma to open and I will take it uh, in the tube for histopathology. So, remove it first. Normally what I do also, uh, especially in bigger polyps, I will show you something here. Uh, when I have the section, I always uh, check like this. I don't know if this could be possible on the camera or not. Uh, could you zoom on this? Like this? Yes, you can focus. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, so this is very important that when you resect something, 
you uh, put it on a, just a piece of paper and make sure that you have a continuous uh, resected area. So this means you don't have a perforation. So here I have a very continuous uh, submucosa, that which means that I have a complete resection without any, uh, without any res residual. Uh, so this is, should go to the pathology. Okay, I, I don't know if we have the ability to do bleeding here or not. No, I'm not no. sure. In this, in the, in this. Uh, no. okay. Yes. Okay. Lamp. So Lamp, we please. have a very, a very uh, tricky question. Already. Do you inject sometimes inside the polyp itself to elevate it, not around the polyp, inside? So inject inside the polyp. And if you do this, when you do this? Yes, I can do this. Uh, uh, if I need more elevation with wider polyps, and especially polyps with a central depression. Okay. So uh, I think if you can show uh, one uh, other techniques of, of the polypectomy. So we are. So we can choose anyone here and try to do uh, just uh, a polypectomy even uh, uh, without. Here first, we are checking this is uh, the perforation that we have closed. I think, Adi, if you can show us also, because for the, for the time frame, if you can resect another one and show us if you have a minute bleeder on the base of the polyp, how you coagulate this. Okay. Okay, so you will resect another polyp. So I will uh, resect another polyp without uh, submucosal injection now, so I need a snare. Okay, uh, we have a, a, another question, Adi, for you. Can you advocate uh, maintaining two, three millimeter margin around the polyp uh, during the resection. Uh, so yes, this is, this is the, the typical. So this is why I, I didn't show this on because this again, this is simulated. This is very important. We need to resect with the safety margin around the polyp. This is the, the two millimeter around the polyp all through that you are sure you don't have any residuals. But again, this is what we say. This is the uh, on block resection for a smaller lesion. But if it's a bigger lesion, Always what I do in bigger legion, I will start resecting piecemeal resection, piece by piece, starting normally from the distant part to the proximal part without bridges. So the, 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 the secret word is without bridges, you need to have uh, the complete resection. Uh, but again, to answer this question, if it's a smaller lesion, I would love to have always a two millimeter re uh, rescue zone around the polyp. Yes, and regarding the two millimeter that uh, uh, the question has said, this is by keeping always the closure of the snare, not at the neck of the polyp, but just proximal two millimeter. So now we will do a, a polypectomy, simple polypectomy for this polyp with a hot snare. So I will tell Salma, please open the polyp now. Open the snare, I'm sorry. So she's opening now. And now I'm going to tell Salma to close gradually. Close, 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 close. Okay. Now Salma is closing, so I will. So you are closing to to, to the max. So now she's connecting. You see, this is also important. Salma will never connect the electrosurgical unit to the snare before all detail her. Okay, now to connect. So she's connected now and you can start the resection. I think it's resected. Yes, eh? it's okay. resected. So, so now we will see, uh, okay, we will simulate as if already there is a minute bleeding, yes. uh, only a minute bleeding at the base of the polyp. So what you're going to do if with the, a very rapid yes. one? Yes, this if it's, a, it's a, a minute bleeding, so I will do hot coagulation for the bleeding with the tip of the snare. So I'll just tell you. So you will push Salma. first this resected segment? No, don't tell me to push it because it may not no, you, be no, pushed. No, 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 you can push it, okay, don't worry. So. Okay, open the snare, please. I'll just pull it, open more, 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 more. Okay. So close gradually. Close, close. Okay, this is, this is very good. This is another technique bef be without a rescue net that you can capture the resected uh, segment, the resected polyp, where you can just open the snare yes. and catch it from the So middle. leave it here. We, we do not want to retrieve it. Open the snare. Yes, close, please. 
So we will uh, assume that we are having here a minute bleeding in this part. Actually, it's like uh, real. So I'll just use the tip of the snare. Please open a very little bit. Yes, more. This is enough. So I will assume that this is a bleeding and I will just use the soft square. Soft, soft, square, soft square, I guess. Yes. Okay, so it's now not we are bleeding. I'm just telling you that what we are doing. Oh, okay, Adi, a difficult uh, question and very important question. When you refer your patient with a polyp to the to, to your surge, to the, your surgeon, to your friend, the surgical department. Well, there are two types of referral. The first one, if I have complication during polypectomy, this will be an obligatory referral. If there is something like perforation that's not cannot be closed by. Uh, uh, they cannot be closed by uh, endoscopic measures. And uh, I know that your question is asking about when I'm doing colonoscopy and I see a polyp and just will decide not to uh, uh, do endoscopic intervention for it. Well, if we are having a flat uh, uh, lesion or a very large polyp and the histopathology here is very, very, very important. If I am having a, a, a on-site histopathology, and we see that we are even intraepithelial or adenocarcinoma, this is for surgical. But actually, in our practice, uh, not only the size of the polyp, the histopathology and number of polyps. So even if we have se uh, so, uh, seen uh, 100 polyps, like 100 polyps, like familial adenomatous polyposis and something like that, we will refer to surgery. But even if it is a large polyp, and it's uh, by pit pattern and by size, it's uh, resectable even by EMR or even by ESD. It's very rare now to refer for surgery. Okay. Uh, I think, Audi, this yes. is, uh, thank you very much. It was, uh, I mean, I'm, I cannot tell you how much I'm excited. For if, uh, Dr. Audi, if the polyp is not elevated by injections. Well, if the polyp not elevated by injection, I will do further imaging and do biopsy. Further imaging either by uh, EOS uh, to know uh, how much we are going far into the uh, 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 walls of the uh, uh, GIT, either upper or in the colon, and we will do further uh, imaging. So if it's not uh, elevated, but it's not reaching uh, the muscle layer, still ESD is possible. And even more nowadays with the full okay, sequence but, but, infection, but, but, uh, especially in the colon, yes, it's possible, yes. And in the colon, even if it's lesion less than 2.5 uh, centimeter, we, we can, can do, do the FDRD. 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 Yes. But if you have a large body, if you have a large body in the transverse colon, and this large body you inject and not elevate it in the transverse colon, in the ascending colon, not elevate yes. it. Yeah, this is for surgery. This is for surgery. This is for the real situation. So, I, I like to say that limitations of polypectomy is very important. Yeah, and I know that most of you are very expert, but don't make everything easy. Uh, uh, <laughs> please, if you have a polyps, which, yes, if you have a polyps, which you injected and they cannot be elevated, go to surgery. But to speak about submucosal dissections or something like that, we are not in a position to do submucosal the sections now for a polyp and sigmoid or ascending colon. So you can refer to the surgery. So you should everyone do his limitations and by his limitations, he can stop either yeah. to refer to a center which is working on that or to go to surgery because at the end, safety of the patient is very important. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay, perfect. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Islamia Valia, Islamia Valia. Al Hawalissa Habib, you are an area Valia. We are not the expert anymore. I think the discussion and for our friend Abdul from India, that I told Hawaii from Egypt, and uh, we, if there's any questions, we are here. So now, uh, 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 now we are, I think uh, all of us are here. I think we'll start by, I think Dr. 
uh, uh, start some questions, but I think we start by the first lectures, and then uh, we go by first and as that, and you can uh, stay until uh, you have any questions. So start it from the beginning until the end, because they are waiting you from the beginning, you are waiting for them until they finish. Okay, so now we have a question for the first lectures. Uh, you you answer some questions. Amul? Amul, yeah, you are okay, here? Fine. Yes. yes, yes. Yes, yeah, please answer your answer. questions by voice because I see that you answer some of them. So answer them by speaking very quickly. Okay. Okay. So the question was Is higher hernia a contraindication a for FedEx? Uh -huh. So, yes. Uh, Presence of a hiatal hernia more than two centimeters is a contraindication. Yes. Up to two centimeters, we can perform GERDEX uh, or any many of the endoscopic anti reflux modalities, but larger hernias require surgery. Second the one. next question was do we need APC marking before arms, and is, is hiatal hernia and contra contraindication for arms? So, yes, we do require. Uh, the marking, we can perform the marking either using APC or a dual knife. It is important to mark so that we can ascertain how much the limits of the resection of the mucosa before injecting in the submucosa. Because once we inject, the mucosal appearance becomes very, uh, you know, distorted and it is difficult to ascertain the limits of the resection. Presence of a hiatal hernia again is a contraindication for performing arms. Okay. Then. There's one question about PS studies, whether they should be performed on PPI or off PPI. So uh, traditional PS studies should always be performed off PPI. However, impedance PS can be performed when patients are on PPI as well. And the other part of the question was, patients who are non-responsive to PPI, should they be offered surgery? Well, the simple answer to this is, Probably yes, either surgery or endoscopic anti-reflex modalities, but a more difficult answer is make sure that the patient has only GERD and not just dyspepsia or hypersensitive LES and all other aspects of uh, you know the GERD uh, paradigm before condemning this patient for any interventional procedure, may it be endoscopic or surgery. The next question is, is ARMA, ARMS or GERDX an option after POEM for symptomatic GERD, GERD? So, yes, of course, we can perform ARMS or GERDX after POEM. However, two issues are there in this. One is that this procedure will have to be as a second session procedure after four to six weeks after the all healing has taken place. So it will amount to another anesthesia and one more procedure in the patient. The second thing is probably performing arms is going to be difficult unless you choose the opposite side because there will be submucosal fibrosis because of the tunnel and uh, so one cannot elevate the mucosa very easily over there. The next question is what are the serious complications of GERDEX in arms? So complication of GERDEX is most common is perforation because the device is quite rigid. And even when we introduce it over the kite wire, there is a risk of perforation if it is not done carefully. And uh, the complication for arms is perforation again or muscle injury. And second is bleeding, which has to be very meticulously controlled. So these were the questions to me. And of course, Professor yes, Ibrahim okay. have some more questions okay. to me. Dr. Azad, Dr. Azad, Dr. Azad. Dr. Azad is here with us. Yes, yes. Dr. Azad, uh, there is one question about what about uh, dexamprazole at the regard to efficacy in comparison to other BBI? Uh, is, uh, I hear another, uh, we have to question one about if the presence of H. pylori with GERD. I Hello. think uh, okay. it's now ended that you can treat each pylori with using a PBI from the start, then continue after treatment of each pylori uh, using the same dose or double dose of PBI. 
never forget that the rebound hyperacidity, which may occur after treatment of H. pylori, will not so bad effect with potent and good type uh, and potent type of uh, PBI like uh, ismoprazole. Um, and no contradictory as regarding this uh, questionnaire, provided that the patient suffering from some troubles due to H. pylori. As regarding question about dexalansoprazole or uh, double uh, delivery system of uh, PBI, that is uh, dexalansoprazole, it's very good in some cases uh, when especially in patient who is nocturnal GERD, as regarding the second curve, which may be a delayed release, uh, PBI uh, help you to avoid uh, patient with uh, nocturnal symptoms. As regarding efficacy, all of the PBI showing the same potency, especially the new brands type ismoprazole, uh, pantoprazole, and dexalansoprazole playing a very potent efficacy uh, with a good comparability. Uh, but only uh, little help us about regarding the main indication for dexalansoprazole is a dual release to avoid nocturnal care. There is any other questions for you? Up to now. No. Uh, up to now. No. No. Okay. There is come to the team of the uh, hand on. Team of the hand on. Uh, Dr. Adi and Dr. Mustafa? Here. Yes, okay. Yes, uh, yes. Yes. The, the first one, it is use adrenaline for injections. Yes, I think, I think we answered it while yeah. uh, we were talking, but um, now uh, we, we depend on elevation and mechanical compression more than vasoconstriction. Yes. So uh, actually we use uh, either saline or saline with methylene blue. Uh, uh, this is uh, very uh, sufficient. Okay, setting of diacermy. I think I answered that also. So uh, in in real patient, we use endocut. It depends it depends on between the effect. But uh, in my daily practice, I do I use endocut with effect too. To any polyps? Uh, to the EMR one, to the one with the with the which without any to the small cystic polyps or even the the piecemeal resection, not to the bigger polyps uh, with the with the big uh, stump, uh, because in the other this is I use another thing normally I put either an endo loop on the base or uh, the new technique of uh, Yamamoto which show interacting clips and then I I put a, a higher effect effect three. Because normally you have a bigger vessel inside which you need to resect. Uh, this is in the pedunculated polyps. So, uh, for, my, for me, uh, for view, if you have a pedunculated polyp and you make uh, either, I use coagulations in the coagulation polyps, uh, uh, coagulation current in the pedunculated polyp. You look for the, for the pedicles during cutting. What is the change of colors in the pedicle or not? Yes. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. What is this? What do you use? What do you look? I, I, uh, because of the sometimes of the not availability of the less availability of the end loop. I, I nowadays I do more and more this clipping technique. I put two clips at the base of the polyps with a with a with a ninety degree between them. I wait for a couple of minutes till I see the discoloration, the bluish discoloration of the polyp, uh, and then I will start the resection. And you start the resections. Far away from the uh, into loop or the or the yes, yes. the clips are better because the clips will stay in position. But I always give a safety of few millimeter above this uh, polyp. I put this the polyps. I put the clips on the base of the pol uh, the stump, and uh, I cut a few millimeter uh, over the clips. This is very important because sometimes when you put very near, it is it is it is slip. Very good. And you reduce the coagulation of the current. You look for and you, without any, without any uh, uh, end loop or any snare, you look for the current for the change of current of medicals during coagulation or during cutting. I didn't get it. So uh, yes, if you are not putting an end loop or you're putting a clip and you are just uh, cutting the clip. Uh, with the coagulation current, not with the cutting current. Uh, so you do you look due to the bluish discoloration within that uh, the process that you are you are coagulating the base, 
So if you start having the blues, this means that you're uh, decreasing the blood supply. Yes, yes, yes. 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 We notice yeah. it because coagulation is uh, closing the blood supply, so we are getting the uh, ischemia and blues coloration. So yes, we notice it very easily. Yes. This is this is this is I think very important. So cut the polyp with the long pedicles. When you cut it, if you see that during coagulations or during cutting, that there is spread of coagulation coming down, that you know that if you cut now at that time, you can use. Normally, you use the snares, use the nurse to have the handle. So all of you using that? Yes. But, 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 but again, as, as Adi said, it depends on the nurses. Huh? So because uh, we personally, we don't work with, uh, let's say, uh, very non-experienced nurses. I, I work only with experienced nurses. So it depends. If you are working with a non-experienced one, you should we handle should handle it. ourselves. Yes. But in our setting here, we are really having the best nurses. So I will let them handle everything. Um, but I, I still, until now, I use the handle on my hand because I get the feeling <laughs> of that. And I use also, I use also the mark. I think the mark, uh, if you can possible to show them uh, the mark, because this is very efficient for the beginners for polyvectomy. Can you show them how to make the mark? Yes. Sure, yes. There's a uh, snare, snare, snare. You have a mark? Yes, I, I, will, I can get you a mark. Because this is very important, Adi, for anyone who's starting to understand what is what's been by that. This is written very, very early, but I use it until now. Myself, I use it until now because yes, it's so good. Yes. yes. Okay. So. Uh, okay, you can. Okay, so uh, so yes, the, what Professor Ibrahim is is just telling us that uh, on the handle here we can uh, we can mark. So I will open a little bit. If you can see, yes, I can I can open the the, the snare, and then when we start closing, let's say this is we know, we know okay this is the size we are no, we don't want to close more than that. We can always mark it here like yes. this yes so we can mark it here so we know that when we are when we are uh, uh, closing we should not cross this yes so, so no, this is point. To, to so know now, stop. very good very good you can uh, tell Adi no 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 Adi continue by that by both hands both the hand of the mark and your hand Adi. focus focus more uh, yes very good make the mark put at the mark yes now yes. still like that uh, close now, close totally. If I close totally, totally. Show me where is the snare now when you close totally. No, it's where all inside. There? And how many outside? It's the, not, nothing okay. outside now because I crossed the mark. So now it's a big part, big part from here up to the end. So if you close it like that by you, uh, by your nurse, you will crush, you will crush the, the polyp. And this is yes, for crushing the polyp. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if I stop okay. at the mark, it will be like this. So you understand that the mark that you are catching, or more than that, you are catching the polyp, so you can use it. Yes. Okay. Um, detailed examination of using enhanced endoscopy play a role before planning. Sure. Yes. I think yes. Sure. This is. This is yeah. This is a question. That is it's I think part of the, of the of the it's a mandatory thing we will not resect polyp without doing uh, a full examination for the polyp as it's, uh, as like as he was explaining assessing the pit pattern uh, assessing uh, the mucosal uh, the mucosa of the polyp itself of the surrounding mucosa and classifying the polyp without resection so I think this is we should all uh, do this this is part of our routine now. Uh, by the new scopes and the new imaging enhancement techniques, uh, polyp classification is mandatory. I know that in Egypt, this is not an everyday procedure, but we should all start doing this, especially in our reports. We should uh, report really the classification of the polyp uh, uh, before doing anything. Uh, so I think this is uh, all the questions are coming uh, to all of you. And it's very nice demonstrations of polypectomy, uh, also of different technique, very nice closure of perforations, 
and also how to inject, what is the type of injections. And this is a very nice demonstration like live. I think it would be very beneficial to anyone who likes to start to me uh, to get some lesson about that. It may be more effective than life because all of them are very calm and you can you make perforation, you don't are afraid, and you make bleeding, you don't are afraid. Because so this is we can get I think more learning by uh, 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 by hand on, and this is uh, around more than 200 people now looking for you uh, and learning how to make polypectomy. This is maybe very difficult during life or during hand on stations because of the little number. So I think this is will be very efficient for uh, 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 training, and I think uh, when it's uh, increasing, we'll have many questions if you go more deep, like. Uh, Hemodamses and US and something like that. There is one question now. I think for, for both of you, I thank you uh, uh, very much for these uh, highly demonstrations. And uh, there is one question coming, I think, at the end. It's for Dr. Hezzet. Yes. Dr. Hezzet, uh, for refractory gel, use Vidiclofen. Uh, Paclofen. Yes. Yes, uh, we have to know that the baclofen is GABA beta agonist. It um, uh, decreases the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Uh, it plays some in, in the study some good uh, benefit in decrease the symptom of GERD. However, it's not established inside the guidelines as a, a drug of uh, treatment for long term uh, in cases of GERD, and they recommend more and more. Uh, detailed uh, randomized study to get it inside the guidelines. Using uh, tricyclic antidepressant and SSSRI in refractory GERD, we go back to the causes of refractory GERD. Uh, we use it in non GERD related, that is, the uh, esophageal uh, hypersensitivity uh, may be play a role using tricyclic antidepressant and SSRI. I will consider them as not a refractory girl, we consider them as a sophageal hyper sensitivity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I'd like to thank Professor Amwal uh, from India uh, uh, for his nice lectures and the techniques of endoscopic management of GERD, like which is then we go to uh, Egypt and not to Cairo, but to Alexandria, a nice place. I enjoy one of it very much to, to visit it. Uh, Professor Ezra to demonstrate the use of PBI. I'd like to thank the team of uh, hand on Dr. Mustafa and Dr. Adi for very nice demonstrations. We give him a very difficult questions. And also, this is very important. And we hope that by next time, the questions of hand on increasing. Because this is, I think, one of very nice mode of education. I'd like to uh, thank all uh, the team uh, working uh, outside the camera, uh, like uh, Moran and like Marwan, and like all other nurses, I like the nurses, I like the company which uh, organized uh, the funding. So everything running very good. At the end, we like to speak about the company which is behind that, which is uh, uh, AstraZeneca which is a very high level of uh, uh, encouraged uh, uh, education since many, many years. And she is working for that. And as you see, they have nothing with polyvectomy. They have the uh, endoscopic management of the is against them. But we try to present all the, or the, the view, not uh, uh, to sell drugs, but to give science. And this is what we need to give science to give education and what's true and what's not true. So I thank you, I thank Roya for that, and I hope to see you very soon in another very nice webinar like that. And uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. See you okay. very soon. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.